Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in the spirit of the rebuttal of debate, and not unmindful of your recent ruling, could I just take a moment to um, remind the member that has just resumed his seat of a Education and Science Select Committee hearing that I attended as a, as a regular member in the last Parliament, at which the then Minister of Science, a Mr Mahari, I think, um, was most defensive about the spend on research in New Zealand. And it would behove that member, I think, to acknowledge that the party that he now represents in Parliament and speaks for on science matters had every opportunity over nine years to do what this government has done in less than three. The Royal Society of New Zealand Amendment Bill, um, Mr Speaker, I had the privilege of chairing a select committee that, that held hearings into the bill. They were constructive hearings. There was broad agreement across the committee and, and across the House that this bill should proceed. It is at the request of the Royal Society. So there is really little more to be said um, without wasting the time of the House than to, to reiterate that the bill has wide support. I support it and I urge its speedy passage through second reading. Uh, David Clendon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And kia ora toto. Um, Mr Speaker, we have continued. Uh, the Greens are pleased to continue to support the progress of this bill through the House, in part as a show of support for the organisation that it uh, seeks to expand, to, um, to strengthen and deepen. The Royal Society has an honourable and long history of doing significant good work for this country, as it has done elsewhere, and I'm pleased to be a, a member, albeit a rather inactive member, of the Society myself. I think the general level of support for the bill is um, given a notice by the fact that it came through the, the select committee process virtually unscathed, um, very little in the way of amendment except of course to the proposal to drop this um, from clause 5.2, the specific reference to American studies. Because try as we might, uh, within the committee we couldn't quite understand why American studies were so unique and different from um, other cultural studies or philosophy or law or politics or many of those other elements that collectively we call the humanities, that it should warrant its own, um, its own statement, its own place. Perhaps um, those who would speak American or perhaps spell American culture, the second word beginning with a K could uh, explain that, but frankly it was unnecessary. But putting that aside, and. Um, Recalling that in the first uh, reading of this bill, I reflected on my own academic uh, history, having both uh, an undergrad arts degree and a postgraduate science degree, put me in a position perhaps to appreciate the, the significant value and in, indeed the necessity of bringing those two sets of disciplines, science and the humanities, closer together both in terms of personal development and critically for economic development for the many aspirations this country has, we will be stronger for having this organisation that incorporates the humanities in it. <coughs> there are so many disciplines that are key to our well-being, particularly given that we are a country that still earns a great deal of its living from primary production and from attracting people to visit us, to enjoy our very beautiful, still stunningly beautiful, but also very fragile and threatened um, natural world, our, our ecosystems, our, our environment, our outdoors. <coughs> the, the, the disciplines that are primarily responsible for the management of the, of the underpinnings to our primary production and indeed to our tourism are of course diverse and multiple. They include geography, resource management, ecosystem management, some branches of ecology and particularly human ecology. These are all by their very definition and certainly by their practice disciplines that do require people who are able to absorb and comprehend and analyse and critically to utilise a very broad range of information and, and indeed world views. And having our Royal Society, who is central to the scientific effort in this country, absorbing or rather amalgamating, might we say, with the humanities, can only strengthen that. 
the best decisions in those multiple disciplines I've mentioned that are all critically involved in land use and production and environmental protection are made by people who are able to understand scientific data and information, even if they are non-specialists, at least to absorb the, the key lessons that science can give to us. People who can also um, grapple with at least at a general level, again, if not specialist level, the considerable complexity of economic and social issues and the interactions between the economy as a set of rela uh, social relationships and the broader set of social relationships that make up our communities and our country. It's important that people making key decisions understand that their world view is unique to themselves and perhaps collectively to a group with a similar background, with a similar education, a similar life experience, but often, unique, uh, often different from, for example, indigenous perspectives or indi uh, the perspectives or world views of other minority groups. And to the, to the degree that we can overcome that understanding between the dominant world view and those of another world view, again, we are going to make better informed, more quality decisions about the management of our productive sector and of our, of our natural environment. And clearly the, the Royal Society, as the, uh, one of the considerable pools of collective wisdom that informs this, um, this ongoing debate and this work, is a very valuable addition to have the humanities come into this. In the more general view, in terms of the science, the pursuit of science and the application of it in this country, I'd like to acknowledge that the government has actually done some very useful work and made some very useful changes in the structure of research and development in the country with the, the different uh, models that are now applied in terms of the CRIs, in terms of the funding, in terms of the research uh, capability. I think there have been some useful changes made there, but I do think there is still some way to go to get the optimum um, set of circumstances. Because as a country, we are actually science poor. We do not attract and educate and graduate and retain sufficient scientists, and nor, I think, in the humanities increasingly. We are losing skills and knowledge rather than retaining or gaining it. And I do think that this... Um, there are some policy settings that could be improved to, to remedy that situation. And I think in terms of science education, we can go right back to secondary school level. I had the pleasure of attending Polyfest um, last week, which was in itself an extraordinary expression of our future, and a particularly um, in our very uh, Polynesian Auckland city. But in that context, I had the opportunity to speak to some secondary teachers, and particularly science teachers. And they have some very interesting views on the curriculum and necessary changes to the curriculum. And I sense some frustration at that level that perhaps they are not being heard sufficiently. The changes at that very important level, the secondary schooling of our potential science graduates, that we are missing out. For example, nowhere in the um, curriculum is there an adequate... Uh, coverage or discussion of issues around climate change. And in 2011, that is an extraordinary omission, that climate change is a reality. It's a scientific reality. It's also something that requires changes to, to human behaviour. So the combination of scientific effort, scientific application and good understanding of how to motivate and affect human behaviour, behavioural changes in people, is very critical to that. So I think there's some work to be done at the secondary level in terms of science education. I think at this tertiary level, equally, we are clearly um, exporting scientists rather than exporting science. Then that continues, and I do, as I say, I make these comments which are critical, but they're also an acknowledgement that I think there is some understanding of the problem within the government, but I do th urge them to move faster and to do more to ensure that we retain the scientific capacity that actually made major contribution to building our society, our economy, and can continue to do so in the future. I'll touch very briefly on the, um, the, some of the issues that were raised by the previous speaker about research and development. We know that members of the, the society have some quite strong views about the appropriate funding mechanisms for 
um, both for public good science and for private sector science, and I think there is some useful work to be done. I think the current model is um, for private sector support, rather for government support of private sector science. I think it is still um, expensive in terms of time. It is it is convoluted, it is difficult particularly for smaller companies to come to grips with and I think changes there would have major economic benefits into the future. Kia ora koutou. The time has come for me to leave the chair. I shall resume the chair at 730